Hello, Calc Kids. This is Mr. Bean. Welcome back to another lesson in calculus. Today's lesson is on vector valued functions and how to take their derivatives. For some of you, vectors are brand new and you didn't learn it in pre calc. If you've already understand vectors and you're good with that, you can look in the description. Go ahead and click on the link that jumps you to the derivative part of vectors. This beginning part of the lesson, I just want to do a quick review on vectors. Now, this is going to be a very basic review, okay? I'm not going into depth on vectors. I'm just trying to remind you real quick what they are and what the, how, they, how they work. So vectors have both magnitude and direction. That's the thing with a vector. A vector kind of looks like a segment, except that it has direction. And so it has both the length, which is the magnitude. Well, I like to think of it as length when you're thinking of the graph and then the direction. So vectors can be represented by directed line segments. Let me draw you one. This would be a line segment. If we put a direction on it, that it looks like a ray. That's not a ray in this sense. So you just have to know what you're talking about. It's not a ray from geometry. This has an initial starting point and then a terminating point on the vector and it stops there. The arrow just tells you which direction you're moving. So that's why it has a direction. Now vectors are only equal if they have the same direction and magnitude. So if I were to take this thing and copy and paste it, that is the same as this. They're equivalent, even though they're not right on top of each other. So as long as they're going the same way, whoops, but as long as they're going the same direction and they're the same length, they are equivalent. If I took this thing and rotated it like this, now they might be the same length, but they're not going the same direction. Therefore, they are not equivalent. So that's how you know if vectors are equivalent or not. Now the magnitude, or maybe think of it as the length, the length of this thing is represented by these two strange little lines. You got a two line there, and then the vector is in the middle, and then two more lines. So these kind of absolute value symbols twice is kind of like what it looks like. That's how you talk about the magnitude of the vector. And magnitude is talking about the length of it. Vectors, what else here? We've got horizontal and vertical components. Now what that means is if you start at the beginning point, the initial point of a vector, if you go this direction until it ends, that is the horizontal component. It's like the X component. And if you go this direction up until the, the vector stops, that is the horizontal component, or maybe you think of it as the Y component. So vertical, horizontal component, vertical component, and the way you write that is in this form. Oh, there's my phone beeping. I don't know if you heard that. Then we have the component form is this weird little bracket, weird little bracket, and then we have X, Y inside here. This is the horizontal component. This number here represents the vertical component, the up and down. So now we just did all that as a review. Let's try one quick problem dealing with vectors. So we're gonna find a component form and magnitude of the vector. I fixed that on the notes, but I forgot to fix it in the video. Find the component form and the magnitude of a vector that has an initial point of one, two, and a terminal point of five, four. So the component form is this. We, we set up our weird little bracket and we're gonna say we the X goes first, right? So the horizontal. So if we're at five and we started at one, it's literally just five minus one. That is the horizontal. The vertical is we ended at four and we started at two. Ended at four, started at two. And then we can simplify that. And our component form for this vector is four comma two with the weird little bracket. That is the component form and that's it. And this just means it changed by a positive four for the horizontal and it changed by a positive two for the vertical. Now the magnitude, uh, so we're gonna go the magnitude, two lines, I'll say, I'll say V for this vector and then magnitude, although V might not be as good. You know what, I'm not gonna say V. Change that, sorry if you already wrote a V. I'm gonna call it R. I don't want you to get V confused with velocity because a lot of times in calculus we'll say V is velocity. So let's use R for the vector. I think I did that in the rest of the lesson. Yeah, I did. So this is going to be, now how do you get magnitude? Let's go back up, back to this. Magnitude is just the length of this, right? The length of a vector. So if I want the length of a vector, I just drew that again. If I want the length of that vector, I would figure out that this is always going to be the hypotenuse of a right triangle, always. So if this is x and this is y, it is always going to be x squared, the square root of x squared plus y squared, whatever that is. Whoops. So that means we go the square root of the x component squared, so 16, plus the y component squared, which is 4. 
So that just equals the square root of 20. So the magnitude of that vector is the square root of 20. Yeah, you could simplify this. Square root of 4 is 2, so it could be 2 square root of 5 if you wanted to simplify the radical, but either one would be fine for that. Okay, so that's magnitude, length of this vector. And now we get into what's called the vector-valued functions. Vector-valued functions are where you have not just a nice simple number for the x component and the y component for the horizontal and vertical change here. It is an actual function that is telling us how the x is changing and how the y is changing. It's actually a bunch of variables here. So in terms of a different variable, that's why it has, say, parameter t. This is similar to the uh, parametric equations that we've been doing. It has some similarities there because you have this extra variable going on. And this is how we're going to use it within calculus. So now to the calculus part. We have a vector valued function. f of t and g of t are the x and y components, the horizontal and vertical com uh, component. And the derivative of this vector is just, when you take its derivative, it is just each component's derivative individually. And that's it. You just take this x uh, component, this y component, take their derivatives, and you're done. It's really simple, actually. And down here, I have a bunch of rules written out for the properties, but it's, it's all the same stuff we've already been doing. If you have a constant in front and you take the derivative of a vector, you just have the constant times a vector. If you're adding or subtracting vectors, and then you, you want to take their derivatives, and then you just add and subtract. Nothing changes. Even the product rule still is the same. If you have two vectors being multiplied and you want their derivative, it's the same as the product rule. Okay, And then the chain rule, of course, as well. We'll do one of these chain rule ones here in just a minute so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so you've got that written down. Let's apply taking derivatives. I think you're going to like this because look how easy this is. The derivative of r. You just take weird symbol. In fact, this is the hardest part, <laughs> taking the bracket, doing it right. The, uh, let's see, horizontal component, that derivative is 4t plus 4. I'm just using power rule stuff. And then we'll do the change, the vertical component. That is going to be 9t squared minus 4. Close your weird bracket. And there is your derivative of the vector r here. That's it. Again, the hardest part was Mr. Bean didn't do the bracket very well. If you compare those brackets, that's not very symmetrical. Okay, this one. Now we're going to have a chain rule affecting this. So here's the way I like to do these. There, You could probably just take this 2t and plug it in beforehand, but there are some little mistakes that happen sometimes when you do it that way. So let me show you. I like to first figure out what's r prime of t. I'll do that first. So then that is 3t squared and then 2. Right? Close the bracket. That's it. There's our prime of t. Now what we're doing is let's figure out what's the derivative if a 2t was plugged in. Well, the difference here is that we're going to say r prime of 2t is going to equal. So the 2t gets plugged into this. So we're going to have 3 times 2t being squared. And then there's nowhere to plug it into this the y component. So close that. But then you have to remember chain rule. So now we will take the derivative, or excuse me, times the derivative of the inside, which is just a 2. So that's the hard part on this, is remembering to take the derivative, plug it in, and then times it by the derivative of the inside. So let's go to my next line. That's going to be 4t squared times 3. That's 12t squared, and then 2 times 2. Now what happens here is when you're multiplying an entire vector by a number, this is called a scalar, you just distribute the 2, so it's really simple. It just becomes 24 t squared, and then this one times 2 is a 4. And that is the answer. That is the derivative of r of 2t. Now the last problem for this lesson is we're going to talk about the slope. So we're going to find the slope of the path of a particle at a specific time. So this has some similarities with what we did in parametrics. I want you to focus in on that this here is the x component, and this here is the y component. And the reason it's important to recognize those is when we take the derivative with respect to x, that's going to give us the slope of the particle at an exact moment of 3 pi over 4. When we plug that 3 pi over 4 in, this is going to be dy dt over dx dt. Okay, so this is an important part that brings us back to what we did in parametrics, and that is just recognizing it's going to be the derivative of this over the derivative of the x. So the derivative of y over the derivative of x with respect to t. So let's go ahead and find that for this problem here. That's going to be the derivative of y is just 
cosine t. And then the derivative of this x component is 2t. So that's how you find the slope at a given point. And then we evaluate it at t equals 3 pi over 4. So let's plug it in. We get, so what does this equal? Cosine of 3 pi over 4. But if you notice, the calculus is done, right? We've already done the calculus part, this. And then we plug it in here, 2 times 3 pi over 4. Now we're just plugging and chugging, figuring out what this is. Cosine of 3 pi over 4. Where's that? Cosine. Cosine of 3 pi over 4 is right there on the 45 degree mark. And that one is negative square root of 2 over 2 all over. And then this simplifies 2 of 4 reduce the 3 pi over 2. So then what is that equal? Negative square root of 2 over 2 times the reciprocal 2 over 3 pi. And then my 2's cancel. And I'm left with an answer of negative square root of 2 over 3 pi. And that is the slope of the particle that's moving along this crazy path with this vector at that time 3 pi over 4. Okay, so just so you'll have a couple problems like that in the practice and probably on the master checks as well, where you have to make sure you understand taking the derivative of this, if you want to find the slope, is you have to use dy dt over dx dt in order to come up with the slope on that. All right, that is everything. We've covered it all for this lesson. Rock that master check. I'll see you back on the next one.